Mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, is currently surging, and I think that he's surging largely because the mainstream media and the pundit class has unquestionably fallen in love with him. And to give you a snapshot as to how in love with him they are, cable news gave him as much coverage as Bernie Sanders, who's the current frontrunner in the Democratic Party primary field. So this is a perfect example that demonstrates how powerful the mainstream news media is because they can take someone who on a national level is completely unknown and turn that person into a political icon simply by covering them a lot, giving him more coverage than other candidates. It's also the type of coverage that they're giving to him because more so than any other candidate, Pete Buttigieg has gotten a lot of puff pieces about him, including in The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, who did a segment about him and literally said nothing bad about him. And Trevor Noah claims, quote, I'm being serious. There's no dirt on this guy, which just shows that Trevor Noah and his team didn't do their research. And additionally, CNN's Chris Eliza ran a nearly seven minute long puff piece on Pete Buttigieg and explained that he's having his moment and he's currently surging in the polls. And we're seeing the makings of a political superstar while not mentioning that really the reason why he's surging, the reason why this phenomenon is currently taking place is because of the mainstream media. Now, this begs the question, why do pundits in the mainstream media love Pete Buttigieg so much, and I think it's because he's replaced Beto O'Rourke as the establishment's best bet to possibly dethrone Bernie Sanders, because Beto's campaign, I mean, even though he is a prolific fundraiser, he's not really drawing very many large crowds like Bernie Sanders is, so they need the next best thing that they can prop up to compete against Bernie Sanders to thwart off this threat that Bernie Sanders poses to the status quo. And he's what I'd like to call a palatable progressive. And he's a progressive to them in the sense that he can pass as a progressive to a pretty large portion of the public. Is he actually progressive is the question because he certainly wants you to think that he's progressive. And even if he's tried to avoid labels, he says if he was forced to, if his arm was twisted, he would self-identify self as a pretty staunch progressive. And the media certainly wants you to think that he's pretty progressive. We're told over and over again just how progressive he is. Now, it's odd because the media often attacks what they call the far left, which they're also claiming he's part of, yet simultaneously reaping endless praise on him. So what's going on here? Is he actually a progressive? Well, what makes a progressive? A large reason why someone like Bernie Sanders is appealing is because of his fundraising. And when you look at Pete Buttigieg's fundraising methods, it's easy to see that he's not very progressive in this specific area. When he was running to be the DNC chair in 2017, he had a pack, and he now has Democratic Party mega donors doing fundraisers on his behalf. And he made it very clear that he's not shutting out the possibility of taking bribes from Wall Street because as Politico's Ben White reports, Pete said in an interview that he would not shy away from seeking Wall Street cash. Quote, but I'm not sure they would be too wild about me anyway, he said, noting that he too is focused on small dollar grassroots donors. In other words, he's willingly making himself susceptible to corruption by opening the door to these bribes that Wall Street will unquestionably give him if he starts to win some primaries. So I don't think that the descriptor that the mainstream media and he gives himself of progressive is appropriate, but that's just based on fundraising. What about the policy? Because there are various policies that I think really are the hallmark of progressivism, modern day progressivism anyways. And these policies include Medicare for all and tuition free public colleges and universities. So what does he say about these policy ideals? Well, at a CNN town hall, here's what he said about Medicare for all. That's why I believe we do need to move in the direction of a Medicare for all system. Now, I think anyone in politics who lets the words Medicare for all escape their lips also has a responsibility to explain how we could actually get there. Because as you know, uh, from working on this day in and day out, it's not something you can just flip a switch and do. In my view, the best way to do that is through what you might call a Medicare for all who want it setup. In other words, you take some flavor of Medicare, you make it available 
on the exchange as a kind of public option, and you invite people to buy into it. There's another name for the policy that he's describing. It's called a public option. But if you'll notice what he's doing here, he is taking that name, Medicare, and he's attaching it to his non-Medicare for All policy because he knows that Medicare for All is incredibly popular, but yet he wants you to think that he supports Medicare for All when in actuality, he's not saying that he's going to do Medicare for All. He's saying that his goal is a public option, Medicare for All who wanted, although it's a goal for him, you know, further down the line. So one day we can get to Medicare for All, but we've got to have a stepping stone first. And to him, that is a public option, Medicare for All who want it. It's incredibly misleading, it's disingenuous, and really it's a bait and switch. But moving on to another really, I think, important progressive issue, tuition-free public college and universities. Recently at Northeastern University, he said that he does not support this. And this is the reasoning he gave. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Americans who have a college degree earn more on average than Americans who don't. And as a progressive, I have a hard time getting my head around the idea that uh, a majority who earn less because they didn't go to college would subsidize a minority uh, who earn more because they did all the way to 100%. I think some of that subsidy is justified because it's an investment in our whole future. But I think expecting somebody to pay zero uh, might go further than, than what's reasonable, especially if we have robust ways to get your student loans forgiven anyway if you're willing to commit to some kind of public service or career in teaching. So uh, I know it's not the most popular answer, but hopefully it can be viewed as a reasonable one. Now, for those of you who don't know, what he just used was a right-wing justification for not supporting tuition-free public college. Because think about this, what do Republicans say when it comes to health care? Well, why should the healthy subsidize the health care costs of the sick? Why should we have to pay taxes that go towards public education if we don't have any kids in public schools. This is a conservative argument that Republicans make against our social safety net, and it is right-wing at its core. But here he is lying to you, saying that subsidizing free college is something that forces more disadvantaged people to subsidize the tuition of elites. What he's leaving out here is that rich people and elites are not going to benefit from public colleges being tuition free because they're already going to send their kids to private institutions, elitist Ivy League schools. So it's important that people are given the opportunity, disadvantaged people who normally can't afford college to actually get into college if they work hard and have tuition be free because for a lot of people it's a non-starter you can't even consider college because the cost of tuition now is a non-starter so what he's trying to do is weasel his way out of supporting a progressive policy but he's invoking a right-wing justification for him not supporting something that is overwhelmingly progressive now what about the green new deal we've gotten a lot of indications from him that he loves the green new deal and he supports it he's spoken very kindly about it but when you look at his platform according to jeff stein of the washington post and what he received from mayor pete well the green new deal was conspicuously absent in favor of quote comprehensive climate change plan and that sounds wonderful but we have to know what that plan is if you're running for president i don't expect you to one day come up with a plan from the jump you should be in favor of a plan but there are other policies that are i think intentionally vague he says that he supports medicare for all but wants to keep private insurance Okay, what does that mean? Because that doesn't necessarily make sense. Do you support the public option that you alluded to supporting at the CNN Town Hall? What does that mean? He says that he has a plan for automation's impact on jobs. Okay, great, but I don't care if you plan to have a plan. I care that you give us the specifics of your plans now, not just promise to have a plan eventually. I mean, how... Are you going to market yourself to voters by saying, look, I promise you I'm going to come up with a bunch of sweet plans. You can't see them right now, but I'll have a plan. Just trust me. It's absurd. So there's a real lack of policy details here that I think characterizes his campaign the most. And he was actually asked about this in an interview with Vice News. And he's leaving out the policy specifics intentionally. He literally said that platitudes should be prioritized 
over thorough policy specifics. Don't take my word for it. Take his word for it. You definitely speak very progressively, but you don't have like a lot of super specific policy ideas. Yeah. Part of where the left and the center left have gone wrong is we've been so policy led that we haven't been as philosophical. We like to think of ourselves as the intellectual ones, but the truth is the right has done a better job in my lifetime of connecting up its philosophy and its values to its politics. Right now, I think we need to articulate the values, lay out our philosophical commitments, and then develop policies off of that. And I'm working very hard not to put the cart before the horse. Is there time for that? You know, they want the list. They want to know exactly what you're going to do. I think it can actually be a little bit dishonest to think you have it all figured out on day one. Look, I think we're all, anybody in this race or conversation is going to be a hell of a lot more specific and policy oriented than, say, the current president. Um, but I don't think we ought to have that all kind of locked in on day one. Uh, yeah, you absolutely should have that locked down on day one, because if you don't run with any policy specifics in mind, why are you choosing to run for president? For example, Bernie Sanders claims that his campaign was initially catalyzed because he doesn't see anyone who's talking about progressive policy ideals. He ran because of the policy. But you're putting platitudes first. You're essentially burying the lead, which is something that a presidential candidate should not do. So that to me was an embarrassing thing for a so-called progressive to say. But the thing is that Pete Buttigieg isn't progressive. It's not just that he isn't progressive enough for me. It's that he's not progressive. He is a centrist. And he even outflanks Barack Obama from the right sometimes because he stated that he was troubled by clemency for Chelsea Manning, a hero who's a whistleblower that exposed the United States government's war crimes. He continues to reap praise on Israel as their government massacres Palestinians and carries out a literal modern day apartheid. And after Israel just murdered Palestinian protesters recently, he then praised them subsequently for their security arrangement as, quote, moving and clear-eyed, and he then chastised Democrats that spoke out against Israel's brutal response to peaceful protests. So I don't think I would say someone who does that is very progressive. I'd say the opposite is true. He's just another centrist Democrat like a lot of other individuals in the field. It's just that he's a lot more effective at coding his words in a way that makes it easier for progressives to digest. And he sneaks in these more centrist ideals in between some bold policies, like wanting to abolish the Electoral College and having, I think, a pretty solid plan to pack the Supreme Court and depoliticize it to an extent. But at the same time, if you look at him to his core, He's not progressive, and I think this is highlighted in a recent article for Current Affairs by Nathan Robinson, where he basically read Pete Buttigieg's book and took him at his own word and realized this guy is not progressive at all, because as mayor of South Bend, it's evident that he rarely converses with ordinary people and instead just surrounds himself with political advisors and local elites. He also seemed eager to eliminate jobs. For example, in his book, he talks about getting rid of the job that trash collectors do and replacing them with mechanical arms on vehicles, not to mention the eviction rate in South Bend, Indiana is three times higher than the national average. There's a enormous wealth disparities between whites and blacks, homelessness and gentrification are giant issues in South Bend that Pete Buttigieg hasn't addressed appropriately, and perhaps the most grotesque anecdote Nathan Robinson writes about that he got from Pete Buttigieg's own book was his plan to repair or demolish a thousand houses in South Bend within a thousand days in order to solve a problem that the city had with abundant vacancies. Nathan writes, make repairs or have your house flattened? Wait, who were the people who were unable to make repairs? Were they by chance poor? Also, how did these houses become vacant in the first place? Were people evicted or foreclosed on? Look a little deeper into the coverage and you'll find that this was not simply a matter of efficient and responsive government, but a plan to coerce those who possessed dilapidated houses into either spending money or having the houses cleared away for development. Community advocates in poor, often African American or Hispanic neighborhoods began to complain that the city was being too aggressive in finding property owners over code enforcement. 
enforcement. The city leveled fines that added up to thousands of dollars in certain cases to pressure homeowners to make repairs or have their houses demolished. Buttigieg's autobiography does not discuss the social implications of his plan. He brags about his audacious goals and ambitious initiatives, but questions of justice and injustice are absent. So just stop and think about that. This is how he chose to respond to an issue of there being too many vacancies in South Bend. Now, throughout the book, Nathan notes that Pete doesn't really talk about the issues in South Bend. The rampant homelessness, which is a crisis, poverty, wealth disparities. He doesn't talk about this. Instead, he focuses on himself. And additionally, on top of that, Mayor Pete has been criticized for not tending to the homelessness crisis, especially last year when temperatures were extremely low and it was cruel to not act when there were people in your city sleeping on the streets. And there was also a scandal that led to calls for his impeachment after he fired South Bend's black police chief for reportedly blackmailing five white police officers because they were apparently caught on tape using racial slurs. And Robinson also talks about Buttigieg's apparent lack of moral judgment and explains that, you know, even though Pete Buttigieg rightfully opposes the Iraq and Vietnam wars, he only opposes them on the basis of them being impractical. He doesn't oppose them based on them being immoral. And Throughout the course of his book, Nathan notes that there's this underlying lack of moral clarity, there's this ambivalence towards the morality of certain political issues, and being a former military intelligence officer, you'd think that he'd have something to say about the U.S. empire, you'd think he'd speak out against it, because you can see how, for example, a candidate like Tulsi Gabbard frequently talks about her experience as a veteran shaped her world view and that's why she's vehemently against the u.s empire it's why she speaks out vociferously against the regime change wars but for whatever reason there's this moral ambivalence or possibly moral obliviousness that mayor pete but a judge has now to be fair he did write about the moral outrage he felt when the governor of indiana mike pence at the time signed a bill into law that let businesses discriminate against lgbtq americans he also talks about being morally outraged with donald trump's immigration policy but the problem is that overall he just seems to disregard moral issues or remains apathetic to them when there are things that should theoretically trouble someone who is a self-proclaimed progressive. For example, he worked for the consulting firm McKinley, which is a morally reprehensible organization that works with dictatorial regimes around the world. They pushed Oxycontin, they work with Saudi Arabia, which is a murderous regime, and they also work with big pharma companies like Purdue, which just rips off Americans. So, I mean, you'd think that Buttigieg, as a progressive, as a so-called progressive, would be speaking out about this, but he just feigns ignorance when it comes to his former employer's unethical actions. Now, to be fair, I don't want to convey to you that he's the worst candidate ever, because I'm not saying that. I don't think he's the worst candidate ever, but I'm just simply saying that if we're looking at this claim that he is a progressive, both by himself and the mainstream media, it just doesn't hold up to even the most minimal amount of scrutiny. All you have to do is a quick Google search and you'll learn that this guy is not progressive. He's a centrist, but again, he's not the worst candidate. He was previously criticized for using All Lives Matter in response to a question about Black Lives Matter, but I think that he had a relatively thoughtful response um, to explain why he used the term All Lives Matter. What I did not understand at that time was that that phrase, just early into mid, especially 2015, was coming to be viewed as a sort of counter slogan to Black Lives Matter. Uh, and so the, this statement that seems very anodyne and, and something that, that's kind of nobody could be against actually wound up being used to devalue uh, what the Black Lives Matter movement was telling us, which is what we needed to hear, because unfortunately, uh, it was not obvious to everybody that black lives were being valued the same and so that is the contribution of black lives matter and it's a reason why since learning about how that phrase was being used to push back on that activism i've stopped using it in that context 
So I thought that was a pretty thoughtful response. I don't know if he's just pretending to be ignorant again, but at least he demonstrated that, you know, the reason why we don't like when somebody responds to Black Lives Matter with All Lives Matter is because they're trying to shut down the conversation. I think that that, you know, it's good that he noted that. So in no way am I claiming that he is the worst of the worst. I think probably the worst 2020 Democratic Party presidential candidate is Joe Biden in the event he enters the race, which it seems like he will. But when it comes to this question of whether or not Pete Buttigieg is progressive, the answer is no. It's an unequivocal no, because he's not a progressive. That's just a fact. He is nothing more than another elitist, centrist, technocratic bullshitter who wants to lie his way into the White House by pretending to be more progressive than he actually is.